In this episode of An American Entrepreneur, we're going to meet a gentleman that began his career in aviation approximately 40 years ago. He started out in the military flying L-4s and L-15s. Then he transitioned into an airline transport pilot for a major airline. He always wanted to start a business and wanted it to be within the aviation industry. So he went to aircraft maintenance school and got his FAA certification and opened Dallas Fort Worth's premier general aviation repair and maintenance shop in Grand Prairie, Texas. It's called J&G Aviation LLC. So come on and join me. He has a lot of advice to share with anyone wanting to start a business of any kind. So introduce yourself and your business, Mike. I'm Mike Jefferson. We're J&G Aviation. Uh, we're a aircraft maintenance, general aviation, uh, privately owned basically, uh, aircraft maintenance business. We've been in business since August of 2015, so we're coming up on our seventh year this year. So what were you doing before you started this business? Well, I'm, I'm a professional pilot. I, uh, I've been flying for 40 something years. I uh, did flying in both the Air Force and the Air National Guard, uh, ended up uh, also flying for major airlines and so still what, doing that. So how were you inspired to go from that to starting your own business? Well, I, you know, I always wanted to have my own business and I looked at a number of different business opportunities. And one thing I knew was I love aviation. I love everything about it. I love the people. I love the airplanes. I love being around it. You can hear the airplanes in the background. It's just, it, for me, that's a, that's a really wonderful place to be. I still look at flying as kind of a magic carpet. So that, that kind of said, okay, well, aviation business. And uh, I've been flying for a number of years and uh, some of the um, mechanics that support me over the years would tell you I was busy breaking them. I really wasn't, but uh, so I wanted to give back, you know, I wanted to fix them. Plus I, I just find it very interesting. I grew up on a farm. Uh, we did a lot of mechanical things just to, you know, to, to, to work on a farm. And so uh, I, I like the idea. And I always wanted to become a mechanic. So I finally, in 2012, I went to mechanic school here at the local Tarrant Community College. And got my AMP license and graduating uh, from that in 2015. Uh, my partner and I, a uh, fellow founder, Mike Gray, was one of my instructors. And so we founded the business that August of 2015. So exactly what are your services? What are your revenue streams for this business? Well, we uh, primarily, we, uh, we, like I said, we take care of the maintenance piece of general aviation aircraft, the uh, sometimes called GA. Um, and the primary pieces of that is every one of these aircraft have to be inspected once a year. Okay, so we do the annual inspections. Uh, we do repair work, some of them as a result of uh, work that comes out of the annual, but also um, many of our customers, if they have an issue anytime during in between the inspection, we do repairs for that. We do it for transients as they come through as well. Uh, we also do installations. Uh, we're putting new equipment into an aircraft per the owner's uh, you know, request, and what they would like to do is they upgrade uh, in their aircraft. And finally, we do uh, pre-buy uh, reviews where someone is looking at buying an aircraft uh, but they want a professional maintenance uh, organization to take a look and find out what, what is and is not good and bad about the aircraft. So uh, we do that as well. So what's the bread and butter of a business like this? Well, the, the foundation is the inspections, of course. They come through every year, so you, you know, the, the, the inspections have to happen every year. Um, and then repairs, that's the primary piece of what we do. Uh, the other things, the uh, pre-buy reviews, uh, the installations we do, but we don't not as regularly and consistently as we do from the inspections and the uh, repairs. Well, this type of business, and correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> excuse me, it's more of a recreational kind of pastime type thing. And I would think maybe possibly when the economy goes bad, is there, are there really a lot of challenges? You, you really feel it real hard in that area? Yeah, well, we're, we are kind of bracing ourselves because I think you know, right now, as you mentioned, it's a little challenging economically, and I'm not sure that that's not going to continue a little bit longer, hopefully not very much longer. Um, so, yeah, there is a concern with that. And most of the general aviation is, you know, recreational uh, traveling. There is some that's done for business. Uh, a number of our owners are uh, small business owners, as a matter of fact, and have their aircraft as part of their business, travel out to see clients or vendors or things like that. Um, but the other side of that, right now in the industry, to pivot, if you will, to the pilot uh, world, there's a real shortage of professional pilots and it's getting bigger every day. So there are a number of our, our, our clients that own aircraft to go out and build time 
so that they can then qualify to put in for other flying uh, jobs uh, as they move up the ladder, if you will. Uh, because time is uh, time and experience, as you might expect, is a, is a big deal in, in, in pilot hiring and your qualifications for what you can go do. Uh, and we also have a, a contract uh, with the Civil Air Patrol, and that's very uh, it's very been a very wonderful relationship for both us, I think, and for the Civil Air Patrol. So, how many hours roughly does it take to go from zero to get all those hours you're talking about? to become, let's say, your basic commercial pilot, and then maybe from that to an airline? Well, you can do, it depends on how, how much you want to fly and how hard you want to hustle at it. You can probably get to the commercial pilot, and you know, there's also an instrument rating that kind of goes in hand in hand. I certainly recommend that you get your instrument rating shortly after getting your private pilot, which is the first license that you, well, your student pilot's the first one, when you can go fly around with yourself or your instructor. And then, of course, the private pilot's like what you have yourself. Um, and then from there, the commercial and the instrument, generally speaking, uh, they both make you a better pilot through that training, but that can be done, uh, I guess, aggressively. You could do that within, inside of a year, but more realistically, I think a couple of years time. But how many hours roughly? Oh, hours. hours. Oh, gosh. Talk about. I should know that right Because now. I know the more hours, obviously, the yes. more hours, of, the more the planes are in the air and the more business. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. We love here. to see our or we love to see our airplanes flying. It's couple, a wonderful thing. Is it uh, a couple thousand hours? Uh, no, I probably to get to the commercial point, probably I think it's four or five. I should know that. But I went I came up through the military system, so it was a little bit different. I do know as an airline pilot, there's an airline transport pilot rating. And that's fifteen hundred hours. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Fifteen hundred hours. So that, you know, that could take, again, it depends on how much you fly. Wow. You know, some folks are, a lot of folks in their, in their journey uh, uh, get their, uh, their flight instructor rating and then instruct around. In the to journey. build the hours. To build the hours, yeah. And, and I think a lot of them, if not most all of them, really enjoy the teaching piece of it too. But it's just, a, it's, a, it's a point upon our journey uh, as a professional pilot. And then, uh, and there's others, some other jobs, some cargo jobs, some um, some things, pipeline uh, things. And then, uh, of course, then there's a whole military route. But that's different because the military is going to take care of that and they don't fly general aviation airplanes. Uh, we, we don't deal with those, except the Civil Air Force is an auxiliary of the Air Force. So, yeah. So as far as the people you hire putting together your team, this is really specialized area. You, you just don't have airplane mechanics. No. all over the place. Is there a shortage of these people as well? And how do you go about finding them and recruiting them onto your team? Well, I'll tell you, there's actually, for as short as we are professional pilots, we're even shorter of mechanics, right? So it becomes a real challenge for us. Uh, and we have a spectacular team, great folks, um, highly experienced, and are, I think are very all, hopefully all, they're all very happy to be here. Um, they do a great job, but to find them, is very difficult, right? Because there are a number of different avenues for an aircraft mechanic to follow. They can go the airline route, right? They can go in some of the engine, uh, like uh, General Electric's engine has a shop here. And, and, and here in Dallas, Fort Worth, there is a lot of aviation, a lot oh, yeah. of general aviation, a lot of commercial aviation, whether it's uh, airlines. Um, <clears throat> there are a corporate, a lot of corporate flying, uh, charter flying and things like that. So <clears throat> there are a lot of avenues uh, for, uh, for mechanics to go. And, and when you say you combine that with not having an overabundance, we do have two mechanic schools here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, which is really extremely helpful uh, over Tarrant Community College and uh, here uh, in AIM, I think it's in Irving. Uh, the one on 183? Yes, the one on 183. Okay. And, and so it's very helpful to have those there. But again, uh, they only put out so many and the demand is, is just tremendous. So. Uh, but I will say this, that that is the, in this business of, of being an aircraft maintenance shop, uh, your people, I guess it's true in any business, but your people are the make it break it. And we have awesome people. Uh, we have been very fortunate to get the right people. They're in here now, um, and, and, but that's hard. So what, how, to answer your question, how you do it, word of mouth, a lot of networking, uh, reaching out to the schools, but uh, you reach out for the experience. Uh, we just have to network with people that we know uh, who would be interested in coming to work uh, here at, for j and Aviation. We, because we're general aviation, uh, we, one of our big appeals, I think, is that you never, you know, every day you do something different. 
a different type of airplane, a different type of work. So it's not that same road, show up to work and you do the same thing again and again and again and again, you know. Uh, so it, it's a challenge. It really is, uh, and, and a lot of it's problem solving. So if you enjoy being facing a problem and going, how do I fix it, right? So that's, uh, I think, another real appeal to being uh, working for us here uh, versus say if you went into the uh, the airline business or the, the the larger corporate things, you're not getting something different every day. You're getting the same thing. When this business, as far as doing this aircraft maintenance and repair, what are some of the really big challenges that you face? How do you overcome those challenges besides the economy, of course? Yeah. Well, I think <clears throat> right now is 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 what's led up to here is the our supply chain. Uh, like so many businesses out there, uh, it's been Boss. tough. It is tough. Now we've we've been fortunate enough to have established a lot of relationships with good vendors, both locally and around. Um, we have lines of communication with them, so we're able to reach out, find parts that even before all this were going to be hard to find. Now it's really hard to find. It's, it, it, there are certain common parts, oil filters. We you know every time we do an oil change, you need an oil filter, right? Uh, who thought that that would be a shortage, but it is. Tires, things that we, you know, things that we did not expect to see until, you know, the last, I would say probably eight months to a year, it's really become apparent, uh, you know, for all the reasons that they have, that we can't get a lot of these things, or we've had to increase our inventory so we have them on hand when it comes up. And it's been fortunate for us, I think also very fortunate for our clients, because we've had some, some folks that do say their own oil change, they go, hey, I can't get an oil filter. Here, I got one. So we, we do it that way. Um, <clears throat> that's been the biggest challenge. Well, second biggest challenge, because the biggest challenge has been finding the right high quality people. And we've been very fortunate. We were, we're there now. We just brought on two mechanics over the last uh, four months, or four weeks, I'm sorry, four weeks. Um, and that, but that's the single biggest, hardest part. The second one then becomes kind of maybe the supply chain and also space. Uh, a lot of the airports here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, they are absolutely, <clears throat> all the hangars are full. There's just not a lot of opportunities. We've been fortunate enough, we have two. Uh, this is one of our two, about almost, um, let's see, it was about almost 4,500 square foot each. So it allows us to work up to eight normally, but we can if right size, smaller size airplanes, we can work up to 10. But <clears throat> that's been kind of the, the, the third challenge for us. So our people first, uh, then probably supply chain. And I would say that the, the the space would have been the number two, but we've solved that at least for now. We're looking for more space. That's always fun. So I know you and I were talking earlier, and I told you that I've thought about, I would love to buy a plane. And if I was to buy a plane, let's say a single engine airplane, obviously I'm going to have to have a relationship with someone like yourself. What are some things that I need to, to look for and some things maybe to be aware of Okay. regarding people that do what you do in this business? First of all, I think like in any relationship, business or otherwise, uh, you've got to be able to work with the people that are the personalities, quite frankly. We all have personalities. We all have ways of approaching our business. And, uh, and you know, in, in there are really good businesses and really good people that don't necessarily always mesh. There are things that are unique about one or the other that say, well, it doesn't work. But I would say, so find you a, a shop, if you will, a maintenance organization, that you can work with, that matches your style. Because we're working for you, right? We work for our customers. Um, they don't work for us. We don't, you know, we, we try to support them any way that they need. So that'd be the first thing. Find that, find a shop that you believe in and, and you can work with. And I would say that usually that has to do with communications. And that's one of the things we try uh, to do, we try really hard to do, is maintain good, transparent communications. What's going on? It's not always good news, you know, but at least it should always be the news, the truth, right? Uh, so trust, big, I gotta trust. have a lot of trust in you. Our one word for our business is trust. Uh, that, if nothing else, I'll tell you something, you may not like it, but I'm gonna tell you the truth uh, as I know it at that point in time. When we communicate on work to be done, whether it's, first of all, it's your approval, so you tell us if you want us to do work. We don't do stuff just because we think it needs to be done. We present it to you, we present to you what it will cost. And you say yes or no. We're like so. So um, I would write. I would think. I know I'm that way. Like with my cars, I want. I have a shop there in Grapevine that they're awesome. I don't even ask them anymore. You know, it's a trust thing. I trust them to tell me 
in, in their best judgment, what's going on. Well, we're the same way. And, and so we want to have that relationship. Uh, it's too hard. It's too hard for you. It would be too hard for us if you didn't trust us. Right. right. If everything was, well, I'm just not sure. So that is a huge deal. So find your organization that you can trust. And to back it around before you buy that airplane, get yourself a pre-buy review. Doesn't have to be us, but get somebody to look hard at that airplane. Don't set your heart on it beforehand. And, I got to have that airplane. Okay but know what it's gonna cost you because oftentimes when people buy airplanes, there's things that need to be fixed. That's kind of an adjunct off to the side. Well, kind of like buying yeah. a house, you have that uh, inspection. Exactly. Well, roughly, exactly. what would that cost me? If I was looking at a Cessna 182, mm -hmm. what would that cost me? Okay, well, Is there so a fixed price on that or? or there is. Just... There is a fixed price. And the way we, we, the way we do it here, and uh, it's it worked very well for our customers, I think, um, is we break that inspection into three parts. The very first part, we look at the log books, we look at the reports, we look at the history, if you will. Uh, and at that point, we're looking to see if there's any expensive things coming up. Usually, uh, there's a thing called an airworthiness directive, an AD, and they periodically, uh, you, you, well, you have to comply with them, and then there's some that come on in a recurring basis. So we go and make sure they've all been complied with. And if there are any uh, that are coming up that are very expensive sort of things. So we, you want to look to make sure that all the paperwork is right. That's the investigative, really. Yeah, it is exactly, it is. It's exactly what it is, absolutely. And so we finish that, we give a report, we come up with the equipment that's on the aircraft because that matters because there are uh, ADs on equipment as well as the airplane, the engine and the propeller. We put that together with an AD report, i.e. listing all the things that apply to that airplane or could apply, and maybe they don't for a serial number or something. And we send those off to you, and then we say, hey, all right, that's that. Here's the invoice for that piece. It's a small, it's you know, it's a smaller chopped up section. And for 182 per your request, I think it depends if it has a turbocharger, if it has an oxygen system. But normally I think it's, don't hold me to this, it's on our website, by the way. Uh, but I, I think it's probably somewhere around six hundred or seven hundred dollars, somewhere in that range. Okay? It could save you an awful lot of money in repairs or surprises. Listen, so you know, and yeah, we've had folks we've do. gone this and we've said, hey, this is what's out there. This and this and this are coming up. Well, you can do one of two things. It may tell you you don't want the airplane, or it may tell you that you negotiate price the price because it's going to have to be done. So then we do that, um, and you say, yep, I want to keep looking. So then we do the firewall forward. That's a okay, firewall. Okay, well, that makes sense because you may find so much stuff wrong with it. That's right. That why do I want to spend more money? You can like, we can we can stop this bleeding now maybe. Exactly. Or waste. Yeah, full, and, and oftentimes right. if you, uh, uh, and I might, you know, different businesses handle differently. A lot of folks will say, yeah, for that airplane, it's a $2,000 for a pre-buy. Well, that's the whole thing. Well, and ours will be about that, give or take. But here's a chance. You, you like what you see or you don't. So far, this is where we're at. You yeah. want to cut it off. Yeah. And, then. and then we do firewall forward. The reason we do that next, which is the engine forward. and all this stuff here for the cockpit, is because if there's going to be, generally, if there's going to be expense, unless it's corrosion in the rest of the airplane, which you know, it's, it's, depends how bad the corrosion is, may not be even worth parting out hardly. But <clears throat> this is where the next biggest expense is going to be. And so uh, we come and we run the engine and make sure it makes all the power it's supposed to make and make sure everything works. And we wash down, look for any leaks. Um, we uh, do a compression check to make sure there's not leaking uh, in the cylinders themselves, past the pistons or uh, past the uh, valves in the engine. Then uh, we bore scope inside the engine, all right? So all, we do all that and we put together a report of what we found, good, bad, or indifferent. And we send that off to you. And we send an invoice for that amount. And again, that's somewhere in that same general give or take neighborhood, you know, six, seven hundred dollars. And you look at that report and you go, ah, yeah, I still like that. That's pretty good, right? So go ahead and do part three. Well, part three is firewall back, if you will. We look at the outs exterior of the aircraft. We look at the interior of the aircraft. We have a, a particular emphasis looking for corrosion because that's something that can be very expensive uh, to, to solve if you have to solve that, right? Uh, anything that's broken or things, we check the avionics, we, you know, see, see what the rest of the airplane is. And then, we, again, we send out a report, we send out an invoice, and now at that point, now you're at that kind of lump sum, but you've gone. So anywhere along the, the line, you want to pull a plug on a review, we stop right there and you haven't sunk extra cost uh, on into the aircraft. Well, that would make me trust you a lot more, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, that's right. That, you know, again, everything 
we, everything we do, we try to build a trust between both of us, right? Um, and it's important. It's critically important, quite frankly. If you didn't trust us to fix your airplane, to give you the answers best that we know them to be true, uh, it's not really a relationship. It's kind of a right. more of a contest, right? And I'm not. We're not interested in that. Never have been interested. In that, so. But when you build those relationships as well and trust, you you get long-term contracts, long-term business, and you come out ahead in the long run. So you do. From yeah. a business perspective, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, it, kind of. I always use the word term mercenary, but it is. I mean, it from a business perspective it makes sense. From a personal perspective. I couldn't do it any other way. I, I just, my, my history has been, I, I'm not like that. I can't, yeah. so I don't. So tell me a little bit about your marketing efforts. I know you're mostly word of mouth, but is there any kind of marketing that you do for this kind of business? Yeah, the, so the word of mouth by far and away is the most effective because people, you know, I can say that we're really good, we're really great. And we really are, we're really good, we're really great. However, I'm the same way. Somebody says it about themselves, you go, okay, yeah, sure. I want to hear it from somebody else. So one of our most effective uh, forms of marketing is our customers go out and they say, you know, J&G has done great work for us. And then they tell it to a friend who has an aircraft or they tell it to a friend who tells a friend or somebody's out looking, do you know any good aircraft maintenance firms? Go, yeah, J&G Aviation. So that by far and away is our most effective. Um, and you know, I think most businesses depend on word of mouth to a certain extent, but there's a passive way, and then there's going out and asking for some help. I mean, well, I know the general aviation community is a small, close knit community. It is. If you mess up routinely, uh -huh. yeah, you're out. Yeah, you've got it. You've got it. Yeah, that's exactly right. You're. Uh, it's like a magnifying glass on that sort of thing. So everybody knows everybody. Marketing can be good or bad, right? It's. I mean, now all the assessments are out there. You know, we're. I mean, we're a. We, since 2017 member of Better Business Bureau, that sort of thing. And, but again, those aren't necessarily always where everybody goes to look right. first off for an aircraft uh, maintenance. One of our other really effective ones has been Google. Uh, Google My Business, now it's called Google something, they just changed it. But because we're local, right, geograph geography matters. Um, so some aircraft maintenance, Dallas-Fort Worth, and then we want to come up on that, right? And so and we're we, right between Dallas and Fort Worth. Yeah, that's right. right. So anybody, uh, we figure most of our, the vast, almost all of our customers come from within probably 50 miles outside the ring, outside of Dallas, Fort Worth area. And, and most of them inside of that. Most of them here at the Grand Prairie Airport. Uh, so, but Google My Business is a really good marketing. To, so it's not, I guess it's not exactly social media, but we also go out on social media and, and we share what we think is really good information that, that will help people. Um, that's an important uh, piece of that. And again, it just uh, gets our name out there, right? People, oh, J&G Aviation, I've heard about them. You may not even recall right off the get-go what you heard about them, but then you'll reach out and, and you'll call and talk to me and we'll have a discussion. They'll say, oh yeah, I know this, that, this is who we are, this is where we're at. We try to keep very transparent on our website. So we put a lot of details out there, which I think is very unusual uh, for aircraft maintenance shops for any number of reasons. But we go out of our way to make sure that we answer as many questions as we can so that someone doesn't waste their time um, calling to find out if, if, if we're a good fit for them or not. So we try to put as much of that out there. That helps, right? So uh, those are the primary ways right now that we do them. Um, we do have, uh, we, we have a presence. We're, we're listed in, for instance, a couple of the owners groups, aircraft type owner groups uh, out there as well. So. That's really our marketing, uh, and then we just, I, I have such a high value for our customers, our existing customers, I try to stay in touch with them and reach out and, and just say, hey, what's going on, or send them something, uh, some information. And so that's, that's okay. marketing. What, what are some of the things that you know now that you wished you knew when you first got started? <laughs> well, I wish I knew myself better, right? right? I didn't, I thought I did, and it wasn't until I took some assessments and started asking some people that were close to me, family, friends, peace. What is it that you think that I'm okay at or do Your well? strengths or weaknesses. Yeah, what are my strengths and weaknesses? And that was a huge uh, enlightenment. I did the uh, Gallup Clifton Strength Finders, right? The, the, everything rank order mm -hmm. one to 34. Uh, it was knowing that you want to stay up towards your five and your top 10 if you can. Maybe hire somebody to do your bottom 10, or, you know. Um, that was a big deal for me. Uh, um, Are these personality strengths? 
Some, you know, it's because, kind of sort. Because you're the, you got to be the sales guy, marketing, mm -hmm. doing the HR, hiring, the accounting. When you're small business, you yep. take out the trash, clean yep. up. Yeah. I mean, so you're going to do things that, that are not your in? forte. Right. Yeah, you're going to do things that are not. But as you grow and you have the ability, you want to find what those things, know what those things are. That and it's kind of easy to find usually because they're the things that you don't either don't like to do. Well, usually you always don't like to do them. And when you do them, it just drains you mentally, physically. You just go, God. And you think, if I could have been doing this other thing, I could have done it 10 times better, 10 times more, 10 times whatever. Then you say to yourself, okay, good. So I don't like doing, and for me, it's a lot of detailed stuff. A lot of the financials, I like the reports, but the actual crunching of the numbers or the details of working the processes out, it's like, ah. Oh, it's hard for me. That's not my, and my payroll. You have never done payroll. Oh no, life. my goodness, no. I've had a, I've had a payroll person from day one. That's something I did right, by the way. And a good accountant, good uh, in payroll, QuickBooks Online, and then hired a bookkeeper shortly thereafter. That has made a big difference uh, in that piece. And then you hired, you said a fractional CFO. Fractional really CFO you that told direction. me yes. What what is it I'm seeing? And these are things you just didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. And a fractional CFO uh, can be very, very cost effective because, <clears throat> you know, especially when you're smaller, there's not, it's, from a CFO perspective, there's not a lot to do, but there's some really critical things. And you build that. <laughs> Must be at an airport. There's airplanes flying, right? Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> critical pieces of information. Uh, about that and you build that foundation. So now as I move forward, I have a much, much better understanding of, of what's out there. So, um, and, and what way, it all means. By the way, a fractional CFO is a part-time CFO. Yes, that's right. What kind of hours did you have this person on board? Was it just kind of hit you a little here, a little there? Well, it was, it was generally, so we would have, we'd have a monthly financial meeting where we talk about it. We look at the budget from the previous month, how we're doing, make any adjustments, and then have some reports. Um, you know, P&L, everybody's reasonably familiar with the P&L, but we'd review the balance sheets. And then we had some other reports we came up with, uh, the uh, uh, cost, uh, the cost, uh, cash conversion cycle. Uh, when you put the dollar in, how long before you get it back out? And of course you want it to be- Cash flow, you gotta manage yeah, that cash you know, flow. Cash flow will kill you. I mean, it will kill you. You could be profitable and go out of business because tell of cash flow. You, I tell a lot of people that you could be making an awful lot of money and go broke because yeah. they're not collecting. That's receivables. right. Look at your accounts receivables to see right. how long they are. And people and if, want to, and people want you to pay them. Oh yeah, they want- Especially yeah. for parts, otherwise oh, yeah. they don't want to sell you anything. Or you become cash only. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. that's exactly right. So that's all part of it. So I, I wish I'd gotten to know myself better. And then I wish I would have been a little quicker to bring in people who had strengths where I had weaknesses. Uh, that was a big deal. The other big one was processes, right? So from the get go, uh, that I would do differently. I would have, I would start my marketing, right? I didn't really, we just passive word of mouth. You know, hopefully somebody's gonna tell somebody and they show up. That just or takes a long time. Yes, it takes a very long time. To get that revenue time. stream flowing. It, very long time where you can be you have passive where you just hope people do it or you can go out and ask people say hey, you know if, if you like what we're doing here could you mind telling somebody that's i mean that, that's how we're building and that's how we're keeping our costs down for you uh is by having you help us and you're helping whoever you're telling because if you obviously like our services and what we're providing uh, you're helping uh, yourself because you're helping us keep the prices down. You're helping us because you're helping us build a business. So yeah, uh, but process building, I would have done that right from the start. So marketing, process building, and hiring people that did things I didn't do. Now, the hiring people thing is tricky because that's cost, right? And when you're first starting out, you don't have a lot unless you you, had, you know were funded that way with the knowledge and every business is gonna be that way. You're gonna have costs up front that you're not gonna have revenue for initially, but they better it better build pretty quickly. So that was it, a business coach, especially for somebody like me. Um, if I could have bought a, bought a franchise, that probably would have been different, right? But for I don't, some people it works great. Yeah, it does, and, and, but, there's, but that's a big sunk cost up front, right. right? You gotta put that money up front. But I got with a, a business coach and a cohort and that helped out tremendously because now you have people uh, like-minded people with different various levels of experience and then you have professionals the coaching staff that also 
walk you and talk you through this and, and recommendations and things like that. So that was a big deal. I wish I had done that early on from the get go. So those are the things I think that, that, that I, if I had, if I was talking to my seven years ago self, that's what I would have said. Self, listen, do these things, right? Know yourself first, make sure you've got uh, people that are that, that counterbalance you, get your process together and get out and start marketing. Marketing is from day one. Everybody wants to develop their product. Our product is fixing airplanes. Okay, how do we do it? The tooling, all that. Even how we do it though, that's a process, but we weren't writing it down. So all those things together. But everybody gets really wrapped around the axle and you know, you've got to have a good product. But if nobody knows it, you could have the world's greatest product, but nobody knows that you're not, you don't have a business because nobody's coming knocking on your door to buy this world's greatest product because nobody knows you have the world's greatest product. So. Well, I know you've been here six and three quarter year. Yep, yep. So more than likely you would not be here today had you not learned that you suck at this, this and this, but you had the wherewithal to bring people in to fill those gaps yeah. because so many entrepreneurs think they can do it all and they end up sinking. And, yeah. and so you at least caught on to that early on. Well, one of the things that really popped in my head when you were talking about processes is you've got all these mechanics and they're working on these different planes. How do you keep track of who's doing what and how much time they've spent on it and how much to bill? Because you bill by the hour. Yes, we do. It's, that's how, that's right. our business. Our so bills. how do you maintain that? How do you, how do you keep track of who's working on what? And what if you've got someone that takes forever to do, you know, three hours to do a one hour job. Okay, well, that's, that's those a metric are really good, absolutely of. metric, and it's a metric we do track. And I have been tracking that for quite some time. I kind of came up with that early on in my own to say, okay, how much do we have in it versus how much can we build, right? Realistically build. build Realistically right. build. And um, so the way we do that is through a, it's a database program called Quantum Maintenance. And it tracks both attendance hours, which is what we pay off of, and then also, hours against a job. And not only hours against a particular aircraft and work order, but specifically a specifically tasked. And you know approximately how long it should take. We to do, do that. It's like a budgeted. In some uh, cases now, it's troubleshooting. We, the, 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 our customer brings us an aircraft and says, there's a problem here. And we're not gonna know what the nature of the problem is till we get into it. So it's okay, troubleshooting, getting access to it, troubleshooting is gonna be, you know, we're gonna guesstimate uh, say four hours, but it could be more, it could be less. And then the repair. And we may say based on, you know, whatever, and it's usually based on the history of that system, what we often find and what that's gonna take. Let's say that it's another three or four hours, right? And, but we also caveat that it could be more or it could be less. Now we bill on the lesser of what we estimate. Now with those though, with the troubleshooting, it's, it's an open end a little bit because you have to, because you don't know what you get. But if we do say a job, we know we're gonna change a tire. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, well, we do. Well, let's say a tire change because it's a real easy. We'll say that you know that's going to be the time we get the airplane, bring it down, jack it up. It's two and a half hours, start to finish. It's done. Okay. If we take and this gets to your other question, maybe a new starting mechanic, and I expect that. I expect learning curves, you know, and the supervision that's there with him. Uh, let's say that it takes four hours. We don't bill four hours. We bill two and a half hours because that's what it should have taken. I can't charge somebody for a work and, and an education. Yeah, that's that's on me. That's on us. And and so that's part of cost of doing business. But the next time that individual, that mechanic, will change the tire probably in a much better time, uh, may not need the adult supervision over their shoulder for the entire time or whatever. So um, that's how that's how we do it. But that's how we track it. And that's how we deal with the billing. Now, when you have the experienced crew that we have now, uh, they're tracking right along with what it ought to take to do the job. And so we have uh, actually shop rates. It's funny, in, in, air, in the uh, automobile industry, they have these books. You know, I think boom, 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 boom. Aircraft industry, not so much. There's some, they're really old. And apparently based upon some of those numbers I see, it was based upon a guy who sat in a corner and that's all he did, <laughs> that one so thing. Super proficient. No and I'm that. going, hey, there's no way we can do that in an hour and a half. We've done that 20 times and it takes two hours. Just, that's it just does. does. I, I can pretend all day that I'm the, the you know, the, the, that OEM person in the corner, doesn't happen no But anyway, but we have, so we've created our own. So a lot of the things we know, um, like I said, the troubleshooting is always kind of the wild card. You don't know, because you don't know what you're going to get into. And different planes take, Longer, summer, shorter. Believe me when I tell you, a lot of these, some of these airplanes were not designed 
by mechanics or for mechanics. They were designed by engineers who were just solving a problem and they leave you that much room to try to get two hands and a wrench in. It's, it can be a real challenge. And, and in fact, one of the biggest cost units that, that our customers understandably are going, what, is the gain access. That's like, that's, that's like- That's where all the money is really, isn't it sometimes? <laughs> sometimes, well, it is it's because we have to fix, do it. Yeah, but... yeah, and that's exactly what happens. We have jobs that will take 15 minutes. The customer goes, well, how long does it take to do that? About 15 minutes. Well, why, why did you estimate three hours? Because we got to gain access. You got to remove the cowling. And... Yeah, and sometimes you have to take uh, like the baffling or you may, you know, other things on the aircraft just to get to it. And then you got to put all that back when you're done. And uh, yeah, so it, it's 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 difficult, but um, the experienced owners understand that they do. They, they do. The they vast majority of our surprised. folks are no, they're not. They understand it. Nobody likes it. I don't like it. I'd, I'd like to be able to get in there and do do the 15 minutes of work, get them there, put them back, have them all flying. Because that's what we're about. We're about everybody who wants to enjoy the magic of general aviation to be able to do it. Whether you're flying an airplane, your airplane, somebody else's airplane, learning to work and fix airplanes, hanging out at the airport, or watching airplanes. The magic of all that, and 40 something years later of flying as a professional uh, pilot, I still feel the magic in any airplane, any like size. And you're doing it. I'm doing it. I've been doing it. Uh, you know, I started off in the military. I flew uh, an old guy. I flew F-4s and F-15s, did all that, did Desert Storm, got in the National Guard, started flying for the airlines, flew, you know, flying uh, bigger jets, and, and, and here I am now. Yeah. So it's, um, but it's still magic. Well, it's let me still ask magic. this question. Where do you see this business at, say, three to five years from now? Or have you ever even given it any thought? So I don't want you to catch you off guard here. But. You would catch me off guard. I've given it a lot of thought, right? We have, we have a three-year plan. We have- uh, You've got a plan. Yeah, oh yeah, we have a three-year plan. We have the, uh, the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal. Okay. Um, we're, we want to be a growing concern, right? There's always a danger when you say, okay, we're going to grow at X percentage. But, it gives you a metric to aim at, um, uh, but really it's more Something about, to shoot for. yes, but more it's about building yourself to scale, right? So when we do our processes, when we look at our accountabilities chart for, for organization, it's built upon the ability to scale. So like right now, everybody in the shop wears multiple hats, right? But when it gets to a certain point and we're going to break off and we're going to fill a new position that takes some of those accountabilities and plugs them in over here. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, no, so our, our, our growth plan is fairly aggressive. Um, so we plan to not quite double because the last two years have been very slow for us. So we've got everything in place and it's happening now. Our business, our volume of business is such um, that given that if we can get the right people and we can get a, probably, I'm gonna need a little more space, we should be able to double within two years time and so go you, forth from that. So you've got two different hangers. Mm -hmm. With Just one hanger in between. Yes, right. Maybe. But I know. Who knows? All that, yeah. <laughs> but how many? So how many total square feet do you have? We both well hangers work. Yeah, working space uh, because we have you know some taken up by offices. Not a lot of office space, but some office space. And of course, on a perimeter, we have some of our little sub shops where we work on tires or brakes or electrical stuff, things like that. Um, but and these hangers are a little over five thousand square foot each. So if you know, if you're going to say it conservatively, you would say you have probably at least 4,000 square foot of floor space per hangar times two is 8,000. Realistically, I think we've got somewhere around 8,500 to 9,000 square foot of floor space. We can run comfortably four airplanes per hangar, so eight airplanes at a time. Uh, and then sometimes we may be able to fit a, another smaller airplane in, depending on what we're doing. But so, you know, and that would support probably a couple more mechanics, you know. And where we're at right now. But right now we're, again, getting our processes right. And, and, you know, and that's the important part. So you've got to get the process far enough along the road that you go, everybody can go, yep, that's what we're doing. And then as you do them, you go, you know, if we tweaked that or we twisted that over there, we did that first before this, you can find yourself with some big efficiency gains sometimes. Right. And our, you know, our, one, our number one cultural uh, value here in the company is the Japanese word for Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. Not a lot, right? You do it a little bit every day. And next thing you know, you go a week or a month and suddenly you've got some significant progress. So we're always trying to get better, a little better. 
I mean, if there's an opportunity to get way better, we will. But usually it comes in increments, and that's, so that's kind of how we do things here. Do you have monthly, weekly meetings where you bring the whole team together we do. and discuss uh, we do. what you're not doing well and what you could be doing better and how to get there? Yes, we do. We have uh, a weekly task we'll meet every Monday, okay? And we have everybody together in a company, uh, usually down over Zoom, you know, it happened out of the thing, Zoom there, but we have uh, one person that the remotes uh, four out of five days a week. The mechanics are all here, but you know what, if I drag them up there to the meeting room, it takes that much longer to set it back up. So they all sit up on their desk and we all jump in and Zoom and we, we talk, uh, you know, find out how everybody's doing. So no coffee and donuts. Well, I bring, I'll bring those down for them later. Uh, they, uh, but yeah, well, we just, so kind of a welfare check and everybody, how you doing? Uh, we share calls for a moment, right? About something about us and what we're about. Um, that's about theoretically my only speaking part, but if you can probably tell, I have a hard time not talking. So everybody goes. Hey, you're out going. Yeah. So, uh, you're a typical but, entrepreneur. So Go we ahead. do that. Well, I'm, I love what we do. And I think we've, we've done a lot of really good stuff. But then we go and then we go over um, what's on our plate for the upcoming week. And, um, and so Black we do large problems. I guess you're still mm -hmm. waiting on this. Yeah, part, that's right. Right. And what airplanes what's and what's the flow? What's the next airplanes in? Where are we at? Um, do we need who do we need to reach out to? Yes, those sorts of things. And then um, we also, you know, I, the last couple months I haven't done it, we should have, it's just we've been so busy, we were shorthanded. We do a, a monthly uh, town hall and then a quarterly town hall, right? How did we do? Just a real quick 15, 20 minute, again, we gathered together, but to cover things we didn't necessarily cover. And we're an open, open book uh, company. Anybody wants to know how our numbers are, what we're doing, they have access to it. We present uh, the revenue numbers and things because those are part of our goals and accountability. That's the other part of the weekly task goal is we have a scoreboard and we all have things we're accountable for. And we all have to answer for, how come that's red? Can, what can we do for you to help you get out of the red? Right. Not, not a finger pointing, you don't want that. I don't want that. I want to know, because we've got good people. So if they're in the red, there's a reason. They need, maybe I can get them something or maybe we can change or something, right? But that's the accountability piece and that's our, Third, uh, our third of our three core values is accountability. Number two, by the way, is, is transparency amongst ourselves when we use Slack for that, and also with our customers. You gotta say what Slack is real quick. So, oh yeah, so yeah, 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 Slack. So Slack is a communication tool. It's kind of, my wife's business, they, uh, they had that, right? And I said, what is it? Is it like texting? She goes, yeah, sort of, kind of not really, right? But it's a messaging thing inside an organization. And actually you can go outside the organization with it, but you create these channels, kind of conversations. And so it's ready built for us because as we have an aircraft come in, there's a work order that goes with it. We build a channel and everything we talk about that airplane, a part we might need or a problem right here, or somebody talk to the owner or whatever, can see it's it all it's stays right there. You don't have to go hunt for it. You don't go through your emails. You don't go through your texts. You, it's all right there. So in house, we stay inside the Slack channels to communicate. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. And that way, if anybody, the director of maintenance, the shop supervisor, the, the team lead on that aircraft, everybody knows what's going on. The parts, uh, purchasing department knows what's going on. It's all right there to find. So that's, yeah, we, we, that's a critical piece of how we keep that transparent calm going to ourselves. And then going out to our customers, usually through an email or a phone call, or sometimes they'll come in, uh, we try to keep them in the loop about what's going on. And we never move forward on anything without their approval, okay? And both in, in scope as well as cost. And we found that that, uh, first of all, it, it, it's, that is a real big pain point for customers, and rightfully so for me too. When I, take my car to the shop. The one I, the, the shop we've been going to now for a number of years, I trust them. Just like I, I hope and we try to build the trust with us. But you go in there and um, you know, we tell them what it's gonna be and either yes or no. And if you don't want us to do that, we won't do that. Because we're working for you. We're not working for us. We're working for you, so. And what are some pieces of advice you could give someone, some guy that's a mechanic that dreams of having his own business? Mm -hmm. What are some things? I guess you kind of really covered it sort of. Know yourself, hire mm -hmm. people to fill in the gaps. Keep in mind, I would I tell you this one. Uh, so I'm a big reader. I like to know things, right? I'm a high level fact finder, whatever that means. I know what it means. It means I like to know things and I like to find out where they fit. And I like to share them with people. What I would share with you is I read a lot. Of, and it just came out of the business coach and the cohort. A lot of books, Jim Collins, any one of his books would be great. 
uh, they're good. But there's one particular one uh, that I didn't read until about two years ago. And, uh, and I do a lot of audiobooks driving back. It's about a 25-minute drive to get down here. Um, so I go through a fair amount. I mean, it's not, it's not some rapid, you know, because a lot of these books are six, seven, eight hours. Um, but it's called The E-Myth Revisited, and I, and I wish I could remember who the author is. But in that, they talk about the process piece, okay? And that would be what I would say is, all the things I talked about before as far as what I would do differently, but get in there and look at the process piece. And they talk about even a single one-off small business that you're not gonna formally franchise, maybe not now, maybe later, who knows? But the idea is you treat it like you're going to. Like, let's say that you wanted to franchise yourself out, <clears throat> all right? And, and that may be how you grow. Maybe it's a, you, you do like one, you set another one up, but you're franchising. But here's the thing, when you go set up that second one, you just did all this, you, yeah, you know this, I forget more, I probably forgot what I had for breakfast, right? So you write these things down and then you pick it up and go. You know what it's gonna cost. You know how many people you gotta have. You gotta know, you know, kind of what the kind of people you gotta have. Um, and so read the myth revisited, get that sense. It's just told in the story from a, a young lady that has a pie shop. But what I was gonna go with on that is one of the distinctions they make because you said, okay, say you're a mechanic and you want to start your own business. Absolutely. And that's how small businesses start. You have something that you're, you're good at, you have a passion for, and you know you can do it better than if you're working for somebody, the boss or, or other shops or whatever it may be. And you jump into that. Never forget that you are really good at that and what you're doing because as a craftsman, and in this book, they'll talk about the entrepreneur, they'll talk about the manager, and they'll talk about the craftsman. And we all have pieces of those in us. Can't Some do it all. Can't do it all, and you will rotate around between these, but be careful. If you're a craftsman and you want to be free to pursue, in her case, she makes pies. In our case, it would be fixing airplanes. Focus hard on that. Yeah, what you if you're gonna start a business, you're gonna move over to the entrepreneur side. And if, you, if that's not suitable to you, see people try to stay in a craftsman piece and all the other stuff, they try to do the, the entrepreneur stuff, but it's painful and you can't scale as a one man band. You just can't do it. You're going to, like you said earlier, you're gonna to have to get help. And it's- Or you're gonna fail. Oh, you're gonna fail. You will fail. And in the course of the story, she Quit. almost fails. Yeah. I don't wanna give away the whole book. And then she has, she has a mentor. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and how you come back. And there's another stage in there. So you get all this going and you're busy being a craftsman and you got all these like, oh, and so you get somebody to come in here and you throw it all to them. Unsupervised, un, really without even a whole lot because you're so happy to have it off your plate. And now you can focus on being a craftsman. You're a business owner. You're, you can't, you can never delegate responsibility. You cannot. You can delegate, do this, Tasks. Tasking in, 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 in uh, you know, authority even. You can say you have the authority to do this, but you can never delegate responsibility as a business owner. So you've got to keep your hand in. So you're gonna have to take some of that transition time to make sure that that person knows. Anyway, that's part of that story that you see that when you do that, and it is, it's such a relief to have somebody come on board. And oh, by the way, uh, I've had those moments, right? I had people I thought were gonna be able to do it, and I just didn't spend the time making sure that they understood my vision and where we were going. And that's critical, absolutely critical. But so all that goes back to read the E-Myth Revisited. It's really, it's a really pretty easy read uh, or audiobook, either one, but it will give much enlightenment to that idea of a craftsman who gets in and starts doing these other things, gets overwhelmed with payroll, with insurance, with rent, with facilities management. HR. You know, uh, HR, all that stuff, yeah. Because as soon as you start bringing other people on board, your, your uh, issues go up exponentially. And- um, Well, how long were you in business before you came across this, this book here? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, four years. Okay, because so you're six and three quarter now. Mm -hmm. So, I well, the good thing is you know that you're always learning, because I know you said you're, you're listening learn. to these books, driving, making yeah. your commute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, well, that's really good advice. Well, I know also too, I found it so, interesting that you brought in a fractional CFO. 
So uh, fractional CFO is just someone that works part time. So how has that worked out for you? Has that really, really been really, really, helpful? really but good? You're not a financial one. Yes, I'm not, and not in any way, shape, or form. Did he uh, put together your metrics and mm -hmm, he reports? Did. And he did, and he explained a lot of things to us. So there, speaking of books, there's another uh, book, uh, Scaling. I think it was a book. Um, I'm trying to remember the end the author, but it talked about what you had to do. And one of the things is a large section on the financials, and you have to understand the financials. I mean, you can go broke not knowing you're going broke, right? You need to understand. So the accounts receivable we talked about earlier is, is, is one of them, but you got to be able to understand, you know, what is the cost to produce what it is you're selling, right? So that's the COGS piece of that versus the overhead cost and how that all ties together in, in, in trending it in the right direction and knowing how you're going to do that and having a plan for that. And then, like I said before, the cash conversion cycle, and there's a number of other things that have come up. now. <clears throat> Tony, our, our uh, fractional CFO, has uh, gone into a full-time gig now. Uh, he, he had retired, he was doing that, but he's, I think it's a, a horse head in a bed, you know, a, a too good a deal to pass up. Um, but, uh, you know, not, he didn't do that uh, until he had taught me a tremendous amount. And we're still good friends. We usually, we try to meet for breakfast on Saturday mornings about once a month. And uh, so we've gotten to be good friends. Uh, you know, I value him as a friend, but I also value him for everything that he taught me. You know, he was a teacher, a mentor to me on the financial side. And I didn't know anything as fractional. Right. I mean, a lot of people think you gotta bring someone in full time, but you don't. And you also, don't. I always tell people too, that you can't manage something if you don't measure it. I, if <laughs> You gotta measure it before you manage it. And I, I, Absolutely. as a CPA, it really kills me when I hear people talk about accounting's a necessary evil. Okay. And I'll be totally frank with you, when I hear someone say that, I think, what an idiot, yeah, what a moron. They don't understand business. You've got to measure it if you're going to manage it. And, and there's, there's a creative ways to manage or, or measure something as well. There are. And but I will tell you, so that's a quick book online. Once you understand what's in there, there's really good information oh, yeah. to pull from it. And but the other piece about that, the corollary to that is what gets measured gets fixed. Right. So, well you know where yeah. your problems are, your shortfalls. Otherwise you don't know. Yeah. And and yeah. it's hard and so we have a scoreboard. We've had it for a while now, but we're were, you know, what is it that matters to you? And then how do you fix it? Your key right? performance indicators. Exactly. That, you got to have that. And you want to get as, drivers. Yeah, yeah, you want to get as far in forward to that as you can. Because a lot of them are lagging. It's like metrics and understanding them and what they're telling you and how to determine, you know, you got your goal, right? So OKRs, are you familiar with OKRs? Yes. Okay, so the, that, that's, to me, that's beautiful, right? Your objective, got it. We're gonna, by the end of this quarter, and we have annual objectives too, but you got your objective. Okay, what's gonna tell us we're going on those paths? Okay, well, we do, if we do this, we do that, we do this, we do that. Okay, great. Well, what are those levers? And that gets down to the, I'm gonna walk every day. Okay, and then those are wildly important goals are what we use. We stole that from our business coach who sold from somebody else. But, you know, Make it's- yourself better every day. Every day. And that ties right system. into our number one cultural value of Kaizen, just a little bit. But do it every day. And that is gonna move, you know, you're gonna move that lever and fairly month, large. Or in a year, you're like this. Like nobody's business. Yeah, if you're just complacent, then- Let's you, hope it does- You may end up going down. Yeah, actually. let's hope it, exactly right. And you're not measuring so it, so you won't know it. <laughs> right, and you're wondering why do I not have enough cash to pay the bills? How'd that happen? Right. Yeah, exactly. And it shouldn't blindside you. Mm -mm. No, no, any, you know, and, and it's kind of like going to the doctor, you know, you're not feeling well, you don't want to go to the doctor because you're afraid of what he's going to tell you. Well, okay, it's still going on. Right. You better get to the doctor and hear what he's got to say. Same way with metrics. Well, I wonder if you last thought you'd want to share then about uh, the company and the business. There is, you know, I don't know if there's anything, anything more rewarding and anything more stressful uh, in my life. I've flown in combat. It wasn't as stressful as... Uh, going through this, I, I would offer that. I'm not sure that you're really a small business owner until you've had to make payroll out of your wall. Oh yeah, most times. people do. Yeah, you know, when it. you're you, you and your three hours of sleep leading up lot, to eating it. a lot of toms. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, yeah. and you know, three or four hours sleep a night, and, and you know, it. And but then you got to look at it. it's not a badge of honor. It's just a reality. You want to get away from that, and there's oh, ways to do that. But you again, you've got to be very proactive on how you run your business and there's the management piece. And see, for me, the managing is not my forte. I mean, I can, right? And I can, I, the metrics part is awesome, 
but that if if you look at it, there's a there's a, a school of thought of visionaries and integrators. Now most of us have various amounts of each one, but I am definitely in the visionary area. I need an integrator. Integrator is a manager. It gets back to the uh, the E myth revisited. There's entrepreneurs, there's managers, and there's craftsmen, and we all have pieces of those in us. How much of it, and where we, and we have to move around sometimes in it. And then, but if like manager for me, I don't like to go there. I can, and I will, but I don't like. So I need a manager. I need to hire an integrator. And I'm, I'm there right now. By the way, anybody with an aviation background that is interested in coming on board and working with me as an integrator, <laughs> give me a shout. But um, but but I, I do recognize that that's not it. Craftsman is fine. I'm good. I'm not I'm not highly efficient. I enjoy working on airplanes, uh, but I'm not Speedy Gonzales. I'd probably be having counseling sessions with myself every day about how slow I was on that. Uh, but I do I am I am an entrepreneur. I, I I relish it. I don't I'm not afraid of it. I do have the stresses of it, but I'm not afraid of it. And I like that piece of it. But you know. When you're starting, you've got to be all three of those for some amount of time. All the hats. And then, yeah. and then you recognize which ones you're better at and worse at, and then start to bring. And we said that earlier, but bring in the talent where you need it. So that's well, the last one. Well, I appreciate you coming on board, sharing your story, Mike. Appreciate it Thank a lot. Thank you, Curtis. I appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Mike has given us some great pieces of advice. One, put together processes of how your business is to provide its services. This not only builds efficiencies within your business but it also lends itself to higher quality control. Without processes, it will be almost impossible to scale your business, achieve any kind of uniformity within your services or products. Second, he expressed how important it is to have metrics to monitor the performance of key metrics that are drivers to the success of any business. I'm Curtis Mulberg, thanks for watching, and see you next time.